In this video, we'll be taking a look at one of IBM's very early laptops. This is the IBM PS2 model L40SX, released in 1991. Unfortunately, just to say off the bat, this will be more of a teardown video rather than, rather than an actual demo. That's because when the machine arrived, the screen was broken. The seller hadn't packaged it properly. Um, with machines like this, the screens are really fragile. And when they shipped this one, what they did is they put it inside a laptop bag and then put that bag inside a box. But the critical mistake is in the pocket on the front of the laptop bag, they put the charger and stuff in, and that just caused far too much pressure and clearly broke the screen in transit. Now I'm also going to go back to them and get a refund for it and get it, you know, return it and stuff. But I thought while it's here, I'll do a video of it anyway just to get something out of it. It's also quite grubby because I've not cleaned it up. I usually clean up all the machines that I get because they're generally in quite a bit of a state. But I'm not going to bother cleaning it because it's going to go back. But we'll sort of ignore that anyway. We can still see basically everything apart from it running. And it's just a Windows 3.1 machine, so it's not really exciting. So we'll take a look at it. So here we have the machine we'll look at in a minute. We'll also take a look at what we got with it. So as you can see, we, come, we get the massive power brick. It's, it's light, but it's huge. You see, compared to my hand there, it's, you know, it's pretty, pretty large. Um, yeah, big IC connector in. And you see the ratings on the top there, so it's 2.7 amp, 15 volts. Also included is this, which is pretty cool. So you'll notice there's no track point or touchpad or any sort of, or even trackball on the laptop itself. So there's no built-in pointing device. So what you get is a trackball. So here it is. You've got a trackball on top and then two buttons and then there's two buttons here as well you can use. And that's just a standard PS2 connection to the machine. There. However, what if you don't want a trackball? Well, this is quite interesting. I didn't even realise until I got it. In fact, when I got it out of the box, I thought this was broken as well because it looks a bit weird because this is also a mouse so you see there like that is a trackball what you can do is there's two clips in the back you can press in and when you do that you can actually lift it up and you'll see the ball retracts in and these buttons become become operational and now what you have is a mouse it's a bit unwieldy it sort of rocks a little bit on the table but yeah it's a trackball and mouse combined it's pretty nice you can see IBM logo there Again, very grotty, it needs a good clean, but yeah, that's it there. So now let's take a look at the machine itself. So on the front, we can have a 9.7 inch um, monochrome display, obviously broken, but that's what it had. Over here, we have the IBM PS2 model designation, and down here we have sliders for brightness and contrast. Down here, we see we have a row of indicators. These are interesting because they're sort of LCD panels that sort of are black, and then when, the, when there's activity, the blackness goes away and it just relieves, reveals a symbol. So these are pretty interesting rather than LEDs. Here we have a mechanical power switch. Over here we then have a switch to switch between auto and manual power saving mode. And then down here we can see we have a large keyboard, which is really nice. It's, it's actually nicer than my ThinkPad 755C. It's really tactile. Um, and it's quite wide, so you've got these extra sort of home row keys actually sort of off to the side here. Now even though it's obviously completely broken, we'll turn it on anyway just to see it run. So the screen will be hard to make out on camera, but we'll see anyway. So switch it on. You'll hear the hard drive will start spinning up. I can probably just make, making up, make out here. It's doing a RAM count. This machine has 10 megs of RAM. It also has a 19 megahertz 386SX processor and a hard drive. I don't know what size it is. Obviously I can't see it just now, um, but when we take it apart we'll try and see what size it is. Now unfortunately because the CMOS battery is dead, it's going to give errors um, and then it's going to ask to press F1. If you press F1, you'll see it'll boot into, you can't really make it out, but this is IBM Basic. This is sort of onboard basic stored in ROM and this has been in IBM PCs back since you know the first PC, so it's been there a long time. Obviously it would boot off the hard drive, but unfortunately because the CMOS battery is dead, it doesn't know to boot from the hard drive. You could fix this, you could boot the reference disk because it actually came with and use that to tell it about the hard drive. I tried this, but unfortunately the entire menu system is right in the middle of the broken area of the screen, so there's no way I could actually use that. And in the end, I'm not gonna put a huge amount of effort into getting it working. I mean, I could put an external monitor onto it, but it's just a PC. It's not particularly exciting, is it? I don't know why it keeps making that noise. But yeah, so anyway, let's turn that off, and let's do the more interesting thing we can do with this, which is take it apart and see how it's built. So the top of the machine is fairly plain. There's really just the IBM branding up there, which has a full model number on it, it's quite nice. Then on the side, we can see we have a single floppy drive, the standard 3.5 inch drive with the eject button. On the other side, we can see all we have is this port here, 
Not sure what that's for. Um, it's not the PS2 port. Um, could be some sort of serial port, I don't know. But yeah, it's got that port there. And then on the back, also on the side, there's these buttons. So these buttons are used to unlock the lid, so you press that in. There's one on each side. And then if you look around the back, there's meant to be a door here, but that's missing. But we'll see we have a parallel and serial port. Here's our PS2 port, which you use for the mouse. And here's the charger port. Now here, you can see this flap folds down and that reveals the original battery. So the battery is located in there. We can press that little tab there and it should just pull out. There it is. There's a battery, which is a really heavy old NICAD. And then there's the contacts on the top. I actually got a spare battery with it. Um, shame I can't really use it, but yeah, it came with one. Then under this slot here, flap here, we can see we have, oh, ah, there we go, a VGA port. And this slot here, which is actually to connect onto a sort of docking base, which provides the ability to run expansion cards. So this is actually an ISA slot effectively, and you can use that to run expansion cards. So now let's take a look at this machine inside. So I've removed three screws from the base, and that releases the keyboard, which is very similar to my ThinkPad 755C. And this keyboard now lifts up, and then can pull away from the back, and can then hinge out like this. And you'll see there's some connections to the motherboard, which you need to carefully remove. These are just old-fashioned ribbon cables, so they just pull straight out like that, and that lifts away. So you see the bottom of the keyboard there. As you can see, it's made in the UK, so that'll be in Greenock in Scotland, which is fairly nearby to me. Um, that's where all IBM stuff in the UK was built. And you can see there, it was made in 1992. And it's, it's quite a heavy keyboard, it's, well, it's quite light, but it's quite thick, it's nice. So yeah, that's the keyboard removed. And now we can actually see the more exciting stuff, which is this machine's motherboard. So now here we are, looking at the motherboard of this machine. So down here we have the processor, which is the Intel 386. It's obviously sold as the motherboard, so that's just a little package there. And interestingly next to it, we have the ULSI Math Core Processor. So this machine actually has a proper floating point unit installed. I don't know if this is aftermarket or this was actually supplied by, I, by IBM themselves. Then down here, I'm guessing probably aftermarket because there's no sort of part number like there is over here. It's just purely just in the socket. Down here we can see we have the WC system, WC system controller. This handles all the sort of memory I.O. and all that sort of stuff to the processor. So it's tied directly onto the processor. This looks like some sort of onboard RAM. And then here we have the stick of RAM here. It says 8 MB there, so I'm guessing this is an 8 meg stick of RAM. And that would sort of couple up nicely with 2 megs on board to give the 10 megs that we see when we post the machine. That comes out there, it's just sort of standard 72 pin SIM. With the IBM part numbers on it. Then over here we can see we have this large chip here, don't know what this is, it seems to be custom IBM sort of stuff, and that'll probably be some sort of BIOS or ROM or something there. Also another RAM slot for expansion, and one thing I've seen here that's absolutely mental is the sheer number of bodge wires here. There's just thousands of them, so you know, one there, one there, one there, there's thousands of damn things. You know, all snaking, there's this one here that goes from whatever this chip here, all the way past the RAM slots, all the way around, and like up to the back there, and I can see another one's peeking out from under there. So I don't know why there's so many. Um, I wonder, don't know if this is maybe like a particularly early model or some sort of you know factory second or something that's got all this because that's pretty mental. I mean, I've got similar machi IBM machines from from a similar period and they've not got any bodge wires. This has thousands. So yeah, let's try and take this part a little bit further. So there's a few screws on the back that I've taken out, and now this panel here will lift off. I have to be very careful here with plastic because obviously at this age it gets brittle. And also because I'm returning the machine, I don't want to break it. <laughs> so yeah, so here we can see we've removed that. And this is connected with a sort of very thin sort of flat flex cable that goes down to the motherboard here. I'm just going to leave that connected, um, but I'll just be very careful with it. And we can see at the back there, there's the back of that panel. So this flat flex is obviously just doing those, those two switches. And then this one here is also what controls that LCD panel. Also on the back here is a manufacturing date of sometime in December, I think it's the 11th, 1991. Obviously that's the manufacturing date of this part, probably not the whole machine. But yeah, so what you now see back here is the sort of drive bays. So over here is a floppy drive with a sort of little plastic bezel there. These drives are all held down with a couple of screws onto the motherboard. So you could just take them off and lift it out. I'm not going to bother just because that would be digging a little bit too far. We know what a floppy drive looks like. But yep, that's a floppy drive. Here we have the hard drive. I don't know what capacity it is, it doesn't say. Um, let me look it up. I'll put it on the screen, yeah, you'll see it, but yeah, there's a hard drive, two and a half inch drive, obviously very thick because of its age, it's a fairly thick drive. 
And interesting, there's two different batteries in here. There's this one down here, which is just a sort of, you know, standard sort of 3 volt lithium cell, Panasonic. That sort of sits down there on a bit of foam. It was just sort of quite loose. And then over here is this other sort of battery here, which comes off somehow. It's taped on. Um, yeah, that comes off, and you can see there. Yep, there's another little battery. Um, don't know if that's rechargeable or something. Yep, it's an iCAD. So yeah, there's a little iCAD battery there. So one of these will be the CMOS battery, which will be dead, and that's why it's you know not retaining settings. Over here, there's also a fair bit of power supply circuitry down the back. And this ribbon cable, which goes to that parallel port, which has sort of just been squeezed in behind the sort of power supply circuitry here. And it's quite a large heatsink for the power supply stuff. Also interestingly, um, on the motherboard next to the flat flex that goes up to the LCD indicators, there's this little chip here from Microchip. This is actually a 32, um, this is well, the part number is an AY0438-L. And looking this up online, it appears to be a 32 segment LCD driver. So it's designed for driving sort of little indicator LEDs and little sort of, you know, almost like seven segment display type things um, from a processor so you can have just a few data lines in and it can, you know, control all the LEDs, L well, LCDs. So that's inter interesting, so that's what that little thing is there. Now this is something I'm quite intrigued by. We saw that interesting port on the side that I said, you know, might be a serial port or something, but I don't think it is because there's this sort of add-on board in here. This looks like a sort of optional extra. So we'll take this out and see what it is, got no idea. So, yeah, it's not screwed down there. Um, but there's one screw, just a flat head screw over here, so I'll try taking that out. And hopefully we can lift this out. I don't have a clue what this is, I wonder if it's some, maybe some sort of modem and you'd use a sort of special adapter on the end there to actually connect to a phone line. Some sort of networking adapter type thing. Could be interesting, don't know if there'll be any clues on it, but let's see. So it's connected into a, sort of simple, a simple sort of socket on the side, so that comes off. And yep, there's that part. No cables. And wow, more bodge wires, there's so many, <laughs> like... Everything's bodged on this. There's like another one there. Like just so many bodge wires. Yep, here's that thing. And yep, I think it's a modem. Why do I think it's a modem? There's a big picture of a phone on it. That probably makes it a bit obvious. Um, but yeah, this is obviously some sort of modem hardware. Some sort of ROM there. So yeah, that looks like some sort of um, modem made in France. So yeah, that was quite interesting. Oh, add-on card. And presumably this is hopefully easy enough to put back in. Probably just put it in and connect that down onto the connector at the end. Which just a little bit fiddly. Yeah, there we go. Yep, I have successfully put it back together. Cool, not broken it. Now I know I said I wasn't going to see what was under the drive because it was going to be a pain to take them out, but then I thought, well, the motherboard sort of does extend under, so we should probably take a look anyway. And since I won't be get I'm not going to be keeping this machine, I should probably look because I'm not going to see it again. So the drive's actually just held with a couple of screws, so there's just one at the front of each drive. And then to take it out you can sort of lift it up. So there's a floppy drive. Lift that out. And under here, under here we can see there's an absolute ton of power supply circuitry. So it's not just this little heatsink on the back, there's these massive capacitors here, which have actually sort of cut out bits of the motherboard to accommodate them. And then just various other little transformer there for something. So there's a fair bit of different sort of power circuitry under here. Which is pretty surprising, so it's not just the sort of power brick that does it all. There's also a lot of stuff on the board. So then obviously the floppy drive, just standard floppy drive, goes into the motherboard, a couple of flat flex cables and into a couple of connectors there. Floppy drive is easy enough to put back, it just sort of sits down and then the screws go in. Now to do the hard drive, the hard drive is locked in a little bit harder, there's little clips at the back. So what you have to do is just slide it forwards and again it just lifts out and work out which way the cables are going and accommodate it. So here's the bottom of the drive. Um, I've actually already got a drive like this that unfortunately is dead. It's a little bit annoying because I'm going to have to return this one. The machine will probably end up getting scrapped by the seller. Um, even though I actually have a use for this hard drive. But yeah, it's an old IBM 2.5 inch, pretty thick hard drive. For comparison, here is a standard laptop hard drive from, from sort of modern times. And as you can see there, it's almost twice as thick as a modern laptop hard drive. Although that's not really, to be su really that surprising given its age. Under here there's actually not as much, there's another sort of WDC chip up here, a couple of little Toshiba chips, some more bodge wires which seem to be absolutely everywhere in here, and yeah that's really it. This is also the cable that then feeds the LCD with a big ferret on it. Now to put the drive back, again we just carefully lay it in, there's these little notches at the back here that the drive has to line up with, so you need to be fairly careful and make sure we slide it in there to lock it in place. 
Also, in the bag this machine came in, I found these two pieces of paper, which appear to be benchmark results from before and after the floating point unit was installed. So you can see on the top piece of paper that it lists the floating point unit as being an Intel 80387. However, the bottom sheet says that there's no floating point unit installed. And then in the top right of each sheet, you can see that the top one with the floating point unit says it performed the same as a 19 MHz 80 with a 51 MHz 287. Whereas the one below just says it performed the same as a 19 MHz 80 without mentioning the 287. So this is obviously the person that's gone to install the floating point unit has done a benchmark of the machine before and after. So that's kind of interesting just to see. So there you have it. That was a look at the IBM PS2 model L40SX. Obviously it's a really sh real shame about the screen being broken. Um, I always hate to sort of see old machines like this getting sort of basically destroyed. I mean this is virtually unusable now. Just due to care of the shipping really. Um, what people don't realise is the panels in these machines are way more fragile than a modern laptop. Like even a cheap modern laptop you can drop and put heavy weight on and it'll be fine. Whereas these screens are really fragile and any flex will just cause this to happen. So yeah, it's a real shame, but at least we got to sort of look at the insides of it and take a wee tour of it before I send it back. So yeah, thank you very much for watching.